missing? If we have to be here, then we'll be here. <laughs> well, we have the glass, so I guess that purple issue. Uh, so no, the, the only reason is that since next next Wednesday, probably what we're going to do, we're going to go and build an all Spend a bit of our time talking about all that. So I want to make sure nobody misses that. Um, also, for next Wednesday, make sure you bring your gray and white book to the class. Uh, because what I'm going to do uh, is to take you over some of the off in that, the schematics of some of the off in that book, Let's explain how different off are designed and how they work and all those things. So we might have to be able to understand that. We'll go over 741, we'll go over some other ones so, to see. Hopefully, by the end of that day, you should be able to explain at least what uh, each transistor does. That all
mirror, for instance, which is driven by some IREF, which now we know how to generate. Okay? And let's say this is the one volt. Uh, or whatever it is. So let's, let's say this IREF is 100 microamps. So I make this a 1 to 20. So to 1x, this is 20x. So this current will be 2 milliamps. Right, I can multiply it up. And so let's see what, what the voltage gain is. Let's calculate the numbers. Well, first I need to calculate the GM of the transistors. What is the GL of each one of these transistors? So how do you calculate the GM? What is the current in each transistor? This is a good number to remember because then you can scale it up and down. 40 millisieverts. 40 milli for 1 milliamp. So if you have 100 microamps, 4 milli. And, and you can scale it up and down. So I'm looking at IC of approximately 1 milliamp and then for a GM of approximately 40 millisieverts. Okay? Now to calculate the gain, I need to know RON and ROP. How do I calculate the RON and ROP? Well, I need to give you the early voltages for the PMP and NPM. So if I tell you VAN is about 100 volts and VAP, let's say approximately 50 volts, what would that give you? Okay. What's ROM? It's uh, 100 volts over. VAN divided by IC, right? Which is 100 volts divided by 1 million, is about 100K. And ROP is VAP divided by IC, that gives me about 50 kilovolts. So the parallel combination of a 50 and a 100 is what? 33, right? Kilovolts, so, so that's basically 40 millisiemens times 33 kilovolts. Kilovolts cancel millisiemens, so I have something like what? 1,200 approximately. Okay? Not too bad. But let's say I'm not satisfied with this. Let's say I want to get more gain out of this. How would I do that? I want to actually be, be argued before. I kind of I told you that, well, the reason is that you want to optimize the frequency response, but I didn't really tell you why. We'll see that exactly how it works out next quarter. But we want to get the maximum gain out of as few gain stages as possible. None, there are some buffer stages, those are okay. You can have buffer stages in between because the, their gain is not very large, actually, it's usually subunity. And hence their bandwidth is quite large. We saw that there was some basic bandwidth gain trade off, and we'll talk about that extensively next quarter again. But the thing is, what happens is that right now I have, I want to maximize the gain in one stage. So what do I do? What is it limiting? Can I, for, let me ask you one quick question. Can I increase the gain by increasing the current? The bias current? No. Why not? Because once, uh, two factors in there, the output resistance and the transfer current is once inversely proportional. Exactly. So the proportionalities are almost exactly the same, so effectively it's independent of current, this, this number. Because if I, let's say, double my current, <coughs> my GM will double, but my RO will have, will divide by a factor of two, so effectively I get exactly the same. So increasing the current is not going to help in terms of gain. So what else can I do? And that also tells me something interesting. If, if gain is the only thing, the voltage gain is the only thing I'm, I care about. I don't care about drive current or something. I may be able to bias this state at much lower current. In one limit here. But anyway, so let's that's, set that aside. So what can I do to improve my gain? Okay, well, use Casco. Why? Because it allows me to increase the effective output resistance. Where would you use Casco? Where? Where, yeah. In the lower path. Why? Why did we go and fix that? See, you have to see where the big problem is. You have to first find your bottleneck, right? Your first order limiting parameter. Is RON more of a limiting parameter or ROP? Which one is the one that they have to go and fix first? ROP, right? So if I were to do one thing, make one of them into a cascode, I would have to make this one into a cascode. But this is the 
one that has a lower value to begin with, right? It's a 50k, right? So I would go and fix it. See, I want to go and optimize, you know, improve the non-dominant problem. At least not at this point. The non-dominant source of problem, the first one is here. So I have to go and fix that. So if I were to make that change, how would it look like? So for now, I'm just showing this as a current source. Now I want to make it a cascode current mirror, right? This is the current. I need a current mirror here. Now we know how to make a cascode current mirror. We've done that before, right? So you use two batches of PMPs like that, and you dive them. So now, what is the gain in this case? Well, of course, still I have the same drive current because on this side I have GMB ID over 2. So this is GM, well, I'm like going in. The GMB ID over 2. And this current is also GMB ID over 2. And therefore, this current injected here, which is reflected through here, is GMB ID over 2. So the GM part of it is the same. The drive is the same still. But the output resistance has changed, and how has it changed? So now looking down, what do I see? Still see all the end. What do I see looking up? Beta. Beta. Are you sure? See beta RO? Half. Half of beta RO, right? We said that this has this kind of feedback in the side. So it's beta P R O P over 2. So now my effective, so let's say my, I have to give you betas too. So let's say beta N is 100, beta P is 50. Now, so let's calculate this quantity. So this is 50 times on 1 million, this was 50K divided by 2. So what is that? That's about 1.25 megaohms, right? 5 times 5 is 25, so that's 2.5 meg divided by 2 is 1.25 megaohms. And this is still the same, so now this is still 100k. So now your output resistance is RON in parallel with beta P, ROP divided by 2. And my gain is that kind of GM. So what's my new gain? Well, what is the parallel combination now? What is the parallel combination of 100 kilo ohm and 1.25 mega ohm? A little bit less than 100, mega, 100 kilo ohm, right? Let's say for all practical purposes, it's 100 kilo ohm. It's a little less. So that's approximately 40 millisiemens times 100 kilo ohms. So I have 4,000. So you see, by fixing the, the dominant problem, I went almost up by a factor of a little bit more than three, three and a half. So okay, it's not too bad. But now, what? Now, what is my dominant problem? This guy, right? Now this is the culprit. Now I took the big rock out of this. So how do I fix that? Say again? Same solution. Same solution. Use cascode on the drive, right, to increase this effective output resistance. So how do I use a cascode on the drive? Well, I need to make these transistors into cascode. So I need to put the transistor here, a transistor here, and I have to have some sort of device, some voltage, <coughs> constant voltage to make sure that this is at the right level. Now when I do that, and then this output resistance, the upper part doesn't change. The lower part, now it becomes what? Beta and RON. Now, here I don't have the factor 2 because I don't have that feedback path. This is not a mirror. So it's just beta RON. So now this gets multiplied by beta N RON, and this would be GN. So now let's see what it is. So now, what is beta N RON? What is this one? What was, what was RON before? It was 100K. So now it's multiplied by beta, so it becomes 10 meg. Now how about this guy? This is the same as before, so that's 1.25 meg. So it's 10 meg in parallel with 1.25 meg. I think it's too close to 1 meg. Right? Approximately. So that's approximately 40 millisiemens times 1 mega ohm. That gives me 40,000. Drive current 
becomes reflected anyway, right? That is true with one caveat. If my early voltage for these transistors, or if I, if I had no early effect, the, the collector current of these two transistors is purely determined by the input voltage, right? So if the stage were balanced, if the stage, if the input was completely balanced, let's say you did this, and you had some constant the model, right? In, if you, your early voltage were, were, was infinite, infinity, right? This two currents would have been, would have been exactly the same. But your early voltage is not infinite, right? It's finite. So if you have a larger voltage on this node, DC wise, than that node, that results in larger current flowing through this guy than that, that guy. That creates an imbalance in the stage. So it creates a systematic offset. That's what we call systematic offset. So you need some constant DC here to make sure that the stage is balanced. So you have to always put that in there. And that's what the offset of an amplifier is. So there are different kinds of offset. You can have an offset because of the mismatch of the transistors. That's random offset. That changes from one chip to another. But this is, this is actually a systematic offset. You introduce a systematic offset when you do this. Because, because because of the way you design it, you have to introduce additional asymmetry. Now, if you include that transistor there, what that does, it maintains this voltage at approximately the same voltage that DC level as that voltage. Because they are both about a VBE below what this V bias is. Right? So, that's why you do it that way. You can do it that, you can do it the way you suggested, but you will have a larger systematic offset. Yes? For which one? Uh, for that one. Here? Uh, yeah, the, the fifth. Where? Do you want to use a diode connected here? You mean, you mean this? Yeah. yeah, what's the back of your thing? What did you gain? Well, if you do this, then this, the DC level of this voltage, what is the DC level of this voltage? Let's say you've done, you've done this. Just let's do that. What is the DC level here? This node. Minus 0.7 volts. Minus 0.7 volts? With respect to what? Minus 0.7 volts? Why? <laughs> well, I, I mean, mm. Think about it. Let's, let's start from here. This is VCC. VCC. What is this voltage? DC wise. There's a VBE drop here. There's a 0.7 volt drop. This is VCC minus VBE. On. Let's say just let's call it VB. Okay? You know what we need. Now what is this voltage? VCC minus 2 VB. What is this voltage? VCC minus 3 VB. Okay? Now, what is this voltage? This one. That's V bias, whatever this bias is, minus VB. Right? So in general, these two will not be the same. Not even similar, uh, right? Unless, unless you go and design your V bias to be exactly VCC minus two VB, right? First of all, that has other implications. This would be too high. This node cannot go down. But even if that were not the problem, that's not a good way of biasing things because you are controlled by two different parameters, right? So you are assuming you, in your design that you have to assume that you, your VCC is fixed. So if someone instead of applying five volts applies ten volts, all your bias points will just completely destroyed. This two levels has the same. I mean, and and, and yes, right? Yeah. These two NPNs have what? The same? The, the same best voltage. The, the two cascode the most. Like the P, like the class of PMOS, uh, P, P and P. So how do you do that? I, I'm not quite sure. I mean, that, there may be some other thing. I just cannot imagine. So tell me, tell me how to draw. Should I put an NPN here? Another NPN? Okay. So here's another NPN. So where does the collector go? Uh, okay. Up here? Yeah. Right. And, uh, where does the base go? The base is back again. Here. Yeah. So that's what we talked about, right? But the left, but the right also has the same base voltage. How? You mean, you mean this is shorted here? Yeah, sure. Okay, this, this doesn't work at all. Right. I'll tell you what, because basically what happens is that you have created a 
what you have, that this node can move and this node can move. So you have a feedback path here. That can do all sorts of strange things. See, because remember, these, these, these two sides are driven out of phase. So when one side goes up, the other side goes down. So what happens is that, let's say I push this up, this node goes down a little bit, this as a result, this node goes down, this node goes down, this was going up, so this goes down and up, and we significantly reduce the current in this transistor. So that's not going to actually, on the surface it doesn't appear to be good for what you, we are trying to do. It may be good for some other thing, I don't know. Right? That's, a, that's a challenge and a beauty of design. Right? This may be useful for something else, I don't know what it is. Doesn't mean that it's not useful at all. But for what we are trying to do, which is kind of converting the pressure for a single end of the thing, that particular topology doesn't do. See, as I said, I mean, we could do it this way, but you have to make this device exactly the right voltage for that VCC, and then that only works for one value of VCC. But the good thing is that if you design it the way we showed earlier, which is like this, then this voltage is generated internally, right? You can use some sort of banding up voltage or some other branches to generate this voltage. Now, that voltage is referenced to this voltage internally, so we can basically, we don't have to worry about what it is with respect to VCC. So if you increase the VCC, what happens is these two nodes go up at the same time, but this level will remain the same. So these two are isolated from each other. See, so you can think about it this way. If you have a high impedance node, so this is one way of thinking about it. See, high impedance node, nodes are like loose springs, right? Low impedance nodes are kind of like connected to ground in a very, very strong spring, right? From a mechanical perspective, if you want to use a mechanical ground. See, if you want to get a lot of gain, you want to get a lot of swing, you want a high impedance node because you always have a certain amount of drive, right? So if I hit it at the same rate, with the same force every time. If I have a loose spring, it just goes, goes swings a lot, right? If I have a high impedance, if I have a low impedance node, it's kind of like a strong, tight spring, right? So if I hit it, almost it doesn't almost move at all. Now, you want to, if you want to have this kind of isolation from VCC, you want at least one side to be a loose spring, right? From that mechanical analogy perspective, is it a loose or a kind of tight spring looking up? It's a tight, right? From on this one, right? <laughs> Sorry, look at, look at, think about it. It's low impedance. There are two diodes, right? So this is a, this is a kind of a strong spring. So let's show it like this. So I'm going to show a strong spring. Q turns, right? But now, how do I show a loose spring? I'm just looking down here, though. This is a high impedance node, right? So it's kind of like a loose spring. Now on the other side, both sides are loose springs. So this is a loose spring, and that's a loose spring, because both of them are high impedance nodes. So if I start pulling this up, this guy can easily float, and this guy can float because it's loose on this side, so it gets pulled up easily. But if I make both sides tight, then I'm, I'm actually going to have to exert a lot of force here, which means that I would have to draw a lot of current to maintain the operation. It's like connecting two diodes between a VDD and the ground. It's like connecting two very loose, very tight springs between two powerful things. So if you just it gets stretched and there's a lot of force, there's a lot of tension in there, which means that there's a lot of current from a mechanical perspective. So think about high impedance nodes as nodes connected to the ground with a loose spring. They're loose, they can move around very easily. And think about low impedance nodes as nodes that are tightly attached to something. Yes. Uh, what happens to the frequency response when, when you cast code for it? Oh, okay. Well, that, that's something we'll talk about, as I said, extensively next time. But the frequency, see, okay, that's an interesting question. So from a cascode perspective, from the input time constant, so see, there are different time constants. We'll talk about this next, next quarter, next year, too. But uh, what we'll do is that basically from the input perspective, the time constant improves because basically this becomes a low impedance node. This is a very low impedance node, if you think about it. Why? Because it's connected to a constant voltage through. What, what is the impedance you see looking into the emitter of this thing? RM, or one of the GM, right? It's a low impedance, so it's very tight. So it doesn't create a lot of problems in terms of frequency response there. 
However, the frequency response in something like this is not limited there. It's limited at your highest impedance node, which is here, the output node. Right? See? So if you have a capacitor here, the ground, some parasitic capacitors, right? That capacitor will see a very large resistance across itself. So this is a very high impedance. No. So the higher you try to make the gain in this one stage, by increasing the impedance of this thing, you will reduce your frequency response, your bandwidth, by exactly the same amount. That's what the gain bandwidth product trade-off comes, comes in. One easy way to see it. Basically, if you want to get high voltage gain, there's one way to do it. Well, there are two ways to do it, really. But one, uh, to, either you have to increase your drive, your GM, or you have to increase your impedance. Right? Increasing the drive is not free, right? You have to burn more current, DC current. But if you don't want to burn more DC current, if you want to keep your DC current constant, the only way you can increase your DC AC gain, voltage gain, is by increasing the impedance. Whenever you try to increase the impedance, you are increasing the time constant. Because any parasitic capacitance there sees a larger RC time constant. Now, how do you get around that? If you were to, if you really wanted that high bandwidth and high gain, the only way is to increase the power consumption. Because that's you can, if you increase the drive and keep the impedance constant, then the time constant remains the same, but you get a larger gain. But that's an expensive way of doing it. So that's why there's a three-way trade-off between power, gain, and bandwidth. Is that even a, even a good discuss this extensively, and then we analyze it and uh, I'll give you a very simple, oversimplistic view of this now. In subsequent lectures, we'll talk about this in more detail. Any other questions? Oh, do you have questions? Yes. In the second uh, gas flow state, will be uh, in the mirror that we have in the second one on the top. Right. If I were to connect uh, the base like, to the connector of the right uh, P transistor. This base? Yeah. To the mm -hmm. connector of this connector? Oh, to the connector of this. This? Uh, I'm sorry, you're off. Here? Yeah. So would that still remain a parameter or? That would turn off this transistor. That turn this transistor off. And if I would right? Write, Think about it. Why, why does it turn it off? Because you're sure that you will be V. So you will be V is zero. Uh, and if I would connect it with the connector, then? If you connect it to the collector, then what you've done effectively, you've shorted this node to that node. Right? So this node is connected to VCC through two VVEs. So it's a very low impedance path. Basically, two RM to VCC, to, to ground. Really. So you, instead of making this a loose spring, you've made it, again, the you get the same tight spring because you've shorted this node to that node. So you won't get much gain. So then for both of these nodes, it pretty much is the same. Uh, if we see the resistance working out like either one Well, yeah, because you've shorted these two nodes. If you do this, you've, this node is shorted to that node, right? No, but if I remove the connection from there. Here? The left one. And the left one that is uh, directly this? directly I can Oh, okay. Well, if you do it, well, you can do something else. If, if you can't do it quite like this, you can do something else. Slightly different. You can do this. Actually, that's a good discussion topic. You remember we had this uh, Wilson current mirror? Yeah. You can make this a Wilson current mirror. So you can make this diode connected and that diode connected. If you do that, you saw that the output resistance of this actually is beta or O. So you can improve the gain a little bit further by doing that. Beta P R O P. But yeah. So you get a back of two there. That's the point. Okay, any other questions? Alright. Now, the, this one, okay, so let's talk about this one. In this case, if I have, so I start floating things, it would be, actually, it is from this node, is, the, is loose from looking up, so this is the loose side of that. And this node is loose from this side. So when it starts push, if you start pulling it up, it kind of behaves like an accordion, just kind of offset, right? so the, this side and then that side will start moving up and down. This is actually, this, this is the way I think about them, right? I mean, the intuition, if you ask me how, how you think about it, this is the way I think about it. I mean, is it an 
analogy in my head right now, basically. But I think about this voltage as a current as something that's either loosely connected or tightly connected to something. Low impedances mean they're held in place to strong. High impedances are kind of loose. And everything kind of inverts when you go to currents amplification. Right? Because so for current amplification, you want actually low impedances. Low impedances are good. Because basically, what you're doing, you're not driving with the current, you're actually driving with the voltage source. And if you have a constant voltage source drive, then you want to generate the maximum current swing. Low impedance is a good thing, right? Because for a given voltage swing, the lower the impedance is, the more current variation you get. And vice versa. Anyway, so. Any other questions on this? But is there a good discussion? I, I, I want you to think about all sorts of variations on this. Some of them don't make sense, some of them do make sense, some of them result in something else. And it's always good for you to go and sit there and say, what happens if I do this and that and that? Because there are infinite solutions. Only a measure zero subset of them has to have been discovered. And we always like that. Okay. Let's try to do a master version. Do a numerical one quickly. I want to kind of, I, have, I want to make a point here. So, if I were to make a MOSFET version, it would kind of like, look like this. And by the way, it could be NFET or PFET, right? The drive could be NFET or PFET. I'll show you the complementary one in a second. Too. So, this is the NFET differential pair and PFET mirror. This is BDD minus S. V dip and V out, okay, and, or you could make the uh, the complementary version, right? The complementary ver version looks like this. So you can have a P pet dip, dip pair. So this is a P pet dip pair. Then you can have an n fet drive. <laughs> right? So you could do it either way. This is just a complementary. So let's let's look at this one. Now, first of all, I have to pick some typical numbers, right? So let's let's pick the same about same value of current, right? So let's say, let's say this is two. Right. And let's say my minimal channel length in this case, this is not a very fancy process, is one, mic one micrometer. So L min is one micro. I'll make this one a relatively large device because I already know that I need a relatively large GM from these guys, right? What is the gain? What is the gain? What is the AC gain of this thing anyway? But the, again, the same thing. Here, this is GM DID over 2. This is GM DID over 2. This is GM, VID over 2. So total resistance, and, and the output resistance R out is ROP in parallel with R minus. So it's very similar to the bipolar case. Right? Now, so the gain is still GM N, RON in parallel with ROP. So I want to get a re reasonably large gain out of these guys. Okay? How do I do that? Well, I need a relatively large transconductance out of those guys. Right. So, how do I increase the transconductance? I know I have to have a relatively large W over L. So, I pick some numbers initially. 100 over 1. 100 microns over 1. Okay. And, so let's see what kind of GM that gives me. I have to also give you some parameters. I have to give you mu and Cox. Let's say mu and Cox is about 100 microamps per volt squared. Cox is 50 microamps per volt square. Okay, so that should be enough. In that sense, GM, which is the square root of 2 mu n Cox W over L ID. Now, the square root of 2 times 100 microamps per volt square times 100 over 1, which is 100. Um, times uh, ID, which would be what? One milliamp per stage, when the stages are balanced. Okay, so you calculate this. So that's, uh, that's 10 milliamps 
and uh, 10, 10 milliamps, 20 milliamps, so this is square root of 20 milli uh, Siemens, because I get an amp milliamp, uh, yeah, amp divided by the whole square, so that's Siemens, so what's the square root of 0 0.02?
you know, let's say 40 over 2. So my L is twice as large, but and my W is not too huge. So ROP is going to be LP divided by ID DXD DVDS P of course. And that would be 2 micrometers divided by 1 milliamp times 1 over 0.05. Um, and that should give me what? That gives me 40 kilohms. Okay? So, so what is my gain? Well, it's this times the parallel combination of 10 and 40 kilohms. What is the parallel combination of 10 and 40? It's about 8, yeah. Right. So, it's about 8 kilo, so that's gain, AB, is 4.5 millisiemens times 8 kilo ohms. What do I get? Looks like 40. Uh, no, 36. 36. It's not too high. That's one of the points I wanted to make. Right? On the same current, I got much more gain out of the MOSFET than my quarter. And that's what happens in reality too. Because basically MOSFET on a given current typically gives you much lower transfer numbers. See, out of, it's almost a factor of 10 smaller, right? Compared to the bipolar. <coughs> and that's achieved even on, even that is achieved on a relatively hard, hard, large W. So I am going to pay the price for that at some point because that's a large capacitor I have to drive with the input. So, you have to think about that. And also the output resistances are lower. So that's one of the challenges in MOSFET. So then the question is, how do I improve this? How do I go beyond this? Well, again, okay, we can play the same trick. And we know that we need it on both sides, the upper and lower side. Anyway, so you might as well do it from the beginning. So we can make the upper tree, upper mirror to cast code. I'm going to do the cascode drive. This is my good pair. And this is my B bias. And that's my B out. Now if I have something like this, again, the drive curve is the same, right? Because I get. GM VID over 2 here, GM VID over 2 here. I have to capture the total impedance on that node, which is the parallel combination of this and that. So now, what are these two output resistances? So let's name these. Let's name these transistors. Right? So let's say M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6, M7. So what is the output resistance looking down? Go ahead. GM5. This? Um, Four. No, I was like, GM, no, the one under This? Yeah. So, so, go ahead. GM, what, that one? This is two, this is four. Right. GM2. GM2. GM oh, no, no. It's actually GM4. GM4, GM4. Or RO four times RO two. Right, approximately. That's a good, good way of thinking about it. So it's GM of this upper one, because this is the guy who gets amplification, right? This is fixed, so the G, it's GM doesn't matter for the output systems. So it's GM four, RO four, RO two, approximately. If you want to do it accurately, it's really RO two plus RO four plus GM two, RO two, RO four. But this is the dominant term, so that's enough. Okay, so that's the output of that. How about this one? Again, the same thing. It's GM6, GM of this guy. R06, R08. So the total output resistance, R out, is the parallel combination of GM2, 
I'm sorry, GM4, RO4, RO2 in parallel with GM6, RO6, RO8. Okay? And therefore my gain is the GM of this guy, GM2 now, because that's, that's what controls the drive. This is the guy that's driving. So AD is GM2 times that. Now let's say for the sake of argument, I keep my W over also the end that's the same as before. So I don't have to recalculate everything. So this is 100 over 1, 100 over 1, 100 over 1, 100 over 1, and these are 40 over 2, 40 over 2, and so on. Now, in that case, my RON and ROPs remain the same as before. Right, so I have to recalculate this. So what I get here is that this one becomes what? What's the value of this one? RO2, which is ROPN, R, oh, sorry, RON, this was 10K. This GM is 40, right? So, I'm sorry, 4.5 4 milli times 10K, that's 45. So this number is 45 times that 10K, so that's 450K. Right? Now, GMP, I haven't calculated the GMP. I have to go and calculate GMP. It's going to be square root of 2 mu P C of W over L of P by D. So that will be square root of 2 mu, did you say mu P C of was 50? 50 micro amps per volt square times, the W over L is 40 over 2, so that's 20 times 1 million. So I get, that gives me 100, that gives me 2 milliamps, that's giving me 2 milliamps times 1 milliamps, that's 1.4 millisiemens. Okay, so that's 1.4 millisiemens times 40k, that's uh, 56, right? 56, so this is 56 times 40, which is, uh, I'm like, Okay, so that's 2.2, right? Mega ohm? Right? It's 56 times 40. That's 2,000 something. Right. That's correct. And that's time GM of the end, which is 4.5 million meters. So the parallel combination of these two. I would, so I would guess it's something around 400 because that's probably 360 kilohertz, 350. If Donald wants to calculate it accurately. Times 4.5 millisiemens, million kilo cancel. So I get 4.5 times 350. So that's uh, 1,500.
right? right? And I drive it with that, so I get that GN, and then I get the RO, whatever. Actually, it turns out that even in terms of RO, is my quarter does usually better than Moscow. But we are not done yet with this. How can I increase the gain even for further? It's relatively simple, right? That's good. Yeah, because in MOSFETs, you didn't have that limitation to buy uh, within my quarter. Yes. And this reduced the current, too. Reduced the current. Yeah, okay, well, true, because we saw that the GM has only a. See, that, we made that interesting observation. We said, look, my RO is inversely proportional to ID. My current, right? So if I make my ID kind of reduce it by factors two, like my RO goes up by factor two. But my GM has only a square root dependence on that. So overall I can gain, I can win by reducing the ID and go up. But there's there's a price for that too. What is the price? Bandwidth is one. Right? Because why is why is the bandwidth effect? Zero plus five. You have less drive time and higher impedance, right? But that's what happens. Right? So that's one problem. What is the other problem? For doing that? You don't have. You have even less drive capability for whatever it is connected here, right? Because you haven't even talked about what's connected here. We'll talk about what happens when you start trying to drive something. Because think about it. this. What is this impedance? Just, just to give you an idea. Right now, this example is what three points, three hundred fifty kilovolts. Or in the case of a the bipolar, what was what was the impedance? Not, we ended up, about one, one megaohm, right? So let's think about it. Let's say you, you, you have some sort of load, right? You want to drive something. Let's say it's not purely capacitive. Let's say you have a resistance of 10 kiloohm. That's a relatively large resistor, right? What happens if I put a 10 kiloohm resistor there? What would my gain be? It would be the parallel combination of this guy and that guy in 10 kiloohm, which is 10 kiloohm. Right? So I'm dealing with this in isolation. This is like a very delicate uh, stage that will give me gain as long as I don't load it with anything, anything substantial. Once I start loading it, then I have to deal with all sorts of different problems. Now, just try imagining driving a 4 ohm loudspeaker with this. All of this is kind of nonsense, right? It's like basically GM times. They're very expensive. <laughs> Yeah, see, kind of, it, it, some people are like this. Some human beings are like this. They can give you a lot of gain if they're biased properly at the right operation point and there's nothing to perturb them. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, I, I actually consider some students like this. They have to be biased exactly at that operation point. But you could also argue that you won't have any gain unless you're biased. <laughs> okay, yes. So, when you say that you are driving the road, could you like, explain it a little bit more? Like, let's say that I have to this kind of circuit and I have a load. No, we'll, we'll talk about that extensively, actually. That's our next talk. How we how drive loads, but that's... That's in this term, right? Say again? That is in this term, right? Okay. Yeah, that's next hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. Don't worry. Okay. And when we try to make it, put, put them all together and drive, make an off we'll see what the limitations of something like that are. But let, let's say, let's not worry about that for now. Right? For the next 10 minutes, let's not worry about it. Now, if I wanted to get higher, higher gain, of course I need to cast go to this one more time, right? And in MOSFETs I can, like in bipolars I couldn't really go beyond that beta or whatever, anyway. Right? But here, let's say I do that, so I'm not going to redraw, so I'm, I'm going to make the triple cast code here and triple cast code there. So let's see what, what, what would the gain be. So we we'll have to see how the output resistance would change, right? How would these output resistances change? There would be another GMRO multiplied by each one of these impedances, right? So this would get multiplied by GMRO, this would get multiplied by GMRO. So your GMROs are about 50, right? So this goes up by another factor of 50. But now, we have to remember, if this impedance goes up by factor of 50, right, you're looking at what? You're looking at something like 15 mega ohms or higher, which is 17, 18 mega ohms, right? 17, 18 mega ohms is a very high impedance. It's an extremely loose spring, right? So it's so loose, in fact, that there are other paths. Even the slightest amount of leakage current. See, you, these are metal lines, right, for instance, on your chip. Your silicon dioxide is not a perfect insulator. It has some resistance. So do other things around it. So there will be some, at some point, those parasitic things become important. And if you go to the triple cast mode level, those things are important. So you will make it. See, if you make this, and actually go make it shift with this double cast mode thing, you get more or less something. If your models are good, reasonable, you will get something close to what you predicted. If you make a triple cast 
um, of, of this. You would predict something much larger, and you're looking at something that would be 50 times greater than that, so that's, you're looking at uh, 75,000 or something like that, right? But you make it, and it, it turns out to be something like 10,000. It's because of these leakage current, unless you model them appropriately. So, how does latching apply to this kind of uh, latch up? Like, where you actually get parasitic uh, like, uh, BJDs made in the chip itself. Yeah, yeah, that's a completely different topic. I mean, so that, that can apply to any of these things. So, what we have a, so let's talk about it a different topic because it's, under, it's an orthogonal topic. Latch up happens when basically when you have this well. So, let me tell you what latch up is since you mentioned it. So, everyone knows what it is. So, if you think about it, if you look at the standard MOS process, right, you have a P substrate, you have your N FETs here. N plus, N plus, the gate problem. And then you have a P well, you have an N well in which you make your P fets. P plus, P plus, N plus, right? So if you start from here, you will see a P, N, P, N structure, right? So you have a P, N, P, N structure, which is a tire scope, right? And it can, under certain circumstances, it basically is like two back and transistors. It, well, not the back, the back really, it's kind of like a, an NPN and a PMP. Like that. And this can act as a four terminal device. Under certain circumstances, it basically latch up. So it goes into a different mode of operation, it locks up. Now, to avoid that, Right nowadays, what we need to do to avoid that kind of problem in general is that as long as you follow the design rules, that they give you design rules in terms of layout. So you need to make sure the way to avoid it is to make sure that this the potential for this node, this well, remains pretty constant. And the way it's done is that you have this well contact, right? You have to have enough well contacts close by to the device and connected to a, the appropriate potential, which probably is the VDD, right? If you keep this at constant potential, you basically kill the gain on this. Tire store. It won't happen. The latch up won't happen. So first when they started making CMOS, CMOS circuits, they had this problem because they hadn't thought about it and all this. But now it has been very well formulated in the sense that the, the, the layout tool gives you an error if you don't put enough yes, contacts at the right place. So it basically detects it automatically. So if you pass the what, what we call the DOS, yes. so design will check, uh, you basically automatically have to take Unless you have some really pathological taste. Basically, what it really means is that the design rules were not written well for that. But they rarely happen nowadays. But since you mentioned it, I just wanted to make sure that people know what latch up actually is. So it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing, yeah. Because basically, latch up draws a lot of current from this path. See, because this is connected to VDD, this is connected to ground, so there would be just kind of a very short, low impedance path with VDD and ground. If nothing works on that. But it can happen with any circuit. I mean, it doesn't have, it, there's nothing specific to this particular topology. It happens anywhere if you don't do it right. When you mentioned that you can cast for many stages and you have a high output of this converter, with that high output of you would think that any leakage current can actually like, uh, mess the circuit up. So because in this case, again, like, this no, if you have a latch up, if you have latch up, you don't have leakage current, you have substantial current. So you have, you're talking about close to amps. Well, yeah, the leakage, it's because of the gain of this feedback loop, right? The leakage can cause that. But see, that's irrespective of that. Now, the problem is that if you will have other leakage through, for instance, this is a reverse bias type, right? So you're reverse biasing this type, you're maintaining the reverse bias. But there is some IS current. There's a reverse current on the type. So that can contribute to a loss. That has nothing to do with latch. If you, if you actually have a close con contact with the web, that wouldn't cause latch up, but that would indeed cause a reduction in the um, impedance. Because it's an alternative path to have it, which you have a model. See, that's the, the, the issue with all sorts of uh, simulators and all those things. Garbage in, garbage out. If you don't model something properly, it will just simulate what you put in there. So you can, on the surface, get some interesting results, and when you make it, it may not match the reality, because you haven't really simulated the reality. There's nothing wrong with the simulator. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> no, I mean, there's something wrong with the way we've done it. We haven't done it appropriately. 
All right. So, uh, any questions on this? If not, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk about output stage.